Hello, my name is Dr. Monica Kittry, and I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist at the UCLA Stein Eye Institute and Doheny Eye Institute. I will be talking to you today about amblyopia, the diagnosis and management of the lazy eye. Please feel free to join in on our discussion on Twitter. You can use the hashtag UCLAMDChat and ask questions or post comments on Facebook Live. Now, what is amblyopia? Amblyopia is the, one of the most common conditions we see in children in regards to vision disorders. It affects 2 to 4% of children in North America. Now, amblyopia is commonly known as a lazy eye, and what it refers to is the unilateral or bilateral reduction in visual acuity that's not directly related to a structural problem within either the eye or the brain. Instead, what occurs is there's a critical period of visual development during early childhood. During that period, if the eye does not provide sufficient visual stimulation to the brain, the brain doesn't have a chance to learn how to process that visual information in a normal manner. Then, once that critical period has passed, the amblyopic eye will always have a limited visual potential in comparison to a normal eye. Now briefly, I'd like to go over what, how visual information normally gets processed. Visual information will normally enter at the top of the slide through our two eyes. And that information that's then gets processed and relayed through our two optic nerves, one coming from each eye. Once it passes through the optic nerves, the information then gets relayed to the optic chiasm. At this point, the information from both eyes gets mixed in a very specific and coordinated fashion so that once it goes more posteriorly, it goes to the various visual processing centers in both hemispheres of the brain. So the information from both eyes will go to both sides of the brain. So in order for us to be able to see well, we need to have not only functioning and healthy eyes, but also functioning and healthy brains and the connections in between. Now, as I had mentioned, there is this critical period of visual development where if the eye does not provide sufficient visual stimulation to the brain, the brain doesn't have a chance to mature in a normal fashion. And this can actually show up in physical changes that we can see in the brain. Now, this is a study that was done in monkeys where one of the eyes was occluded during early childhood. And you can see this is this figure on the right is a picture of the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN. This is one of the visual processing centers in the brain. Now the LGN, as we mentioned before, receives information from both eyes, and it processes and interprets that information within these various ocular dominance columns, which you can appreciate with these various striations. Now what's striking here about this study is that you can see that these ocular dominance columns that are associated with the good eye, this is the eye that was not occluded during early childhood. And you can see how robust the metabolic signal is from these parts of the brain. This is in contrast to the ocular dominance columns that are associated with the bad eye, the eye that was occluded during early childhood. So these parts of the brain did not develop as well as the other parts did. So in amblyopia, when there's poor vision in early childhood, that can cause lasting changes inside the brain that can persist well beyond childhood. Now what is this critical period of amblyopia? What is this critical period of visual development? Well, we usually say that most visual development in children is complete by the age of eight to nine years. However, it's important to note that earlier events in earlier childhood can impact amblyopia and impact a patient's long-term visual potential more than events that occur later in life. So if we take, for instance, cataracts. Cataracts are an opacification of the lens that's inside the eye. Babies who have congenital cataracts, which would be present either at birth or shortly thereafter can have much more profound amblyopia than those patients who develop um, cataracts later on during their childhood. For example, even at the age of two to three years. Now what are the different types of amblyopia? There's essentially three types, strabismus, visual deprivation, and refractive error. And we're gonna go through each of these types in more detail in the coming slides. So first off, strabismus. Strabismus refers to an ocular misalignment. The eyes are not straight. In an adult, if they developed acute onset of strabismus, they would suffer double vision. However, in children, because their brains are still adaptive, in an effort to avoid the double vision, the brain instead suppresses the images from one eye. 
while that does get rid of the double vision, that also puts them at risk for amblyopia. Now this is a pictorial representation of what occurs in strabismus and amblyopia. Now you can see that most of the time when patients do not have strabismus, their eyes are, are directed at one single visual object, in this case either the tree or the house. This patient in this picture here has esotropia, or a crossing of the eyes, so the eyes are directed at different visual objects, and this can give rise to visual confusion or double vision. So in a child, in an effort to avoid that double vision and visual confusion, they will suppress the images from one eye. While that helps them functionally and to be able to navigate their environment without stumbling over things, that unfortunately comes at a cost of amblyopia because that brain is no longer getting the visual stimulation from that eye. Now what about visual deprivation amblyopia? Visual deprivation amblyopia occurs when there's a structural problem within the eye that prevents light from being able to enter and then get passed on to the brain. Now, there are several different causes for visual deprivation amblyopia. One of those causes is congenital cataracts. You can see here on this figure to the, to the left how um, this patient has a, an abnormal pupillary reflex, that whitening of the lens right here that you can see, and that prevents light from being able to enter that eye. You can also see it with congenital ptosis. Ptosis refers to a droopiness of the eyelid. You can see here in this middle figure how the left eyelid is lower than the pupillary axis. And again, same thing, it's preventing light from being able to enter the eye and being passed on to the brain. And our final example is in the far right, you can see the picture of a corneal opacification. The cornea is the most anterior aspect of the eye, and it's clear. Now, if there is an opacification of that cornea, then light, again, is inhibited from being able to enter to the eye. Finally, we have refractive amblyopia. Now, refractive error refers to a focusing problem with the eye. In this case, the light still is able to enter the eye and visual information is still able to be sent to the brain, but unfortunately, those images are out of focus and blurred. And the higher the refractive error, the deeper the amblyopia. Now, there are different types of refractive error that we look for. One is myopia, which is nearsightedness, hyperopia, which is farsightedness, and astigmatism. Astigmatism refers to the, the eye that's not perfectly round, the eye that's oval, for example, like a football, and that can cause visual distortions. Now, again, amblyopia, is particularly in refractive am amblyopia, can be either unilateral or bilateral. In the cases where you have unilateral refractive amblyopia, we term that anisometropic amblyopia. And that's where there's a big difference in refractive error between the two eyes, and the brain selectively chooses to ignore the eye that has the higher refractive error. So how do we diagnose amblyopia? As you can imagine, diagnosing any type of vision disorder in a child is very challenging because they can't tell us when there's something wrong with their eyes or something wrong with their vision. So we're very reliant upon the signs and symptoms of vision problems being picked up by parents or primary care providers. And one of the ways that we really do this is through well child visits. During every well child visit, your primary care provider is taking a look at your child's eyes and screening for various ocular problems. So some of the things that they're looking for is nystagmus, which is an involuntary shaking of the eyes, strabismus, a poor pupillary reflex, and any other structural abnormalities of the eyes. They are also looking for normal visual behavior in the child. So at birth, that can be as simple as, does the baby react to light? Is there a blinking or a grimacing that occurs when a bright light is shown in their face? But by the age of two to three months, that visual behavior really should have matured to the point where they're able to follow objects and toys, particularly their parents' faces. And then by the age of three to five years, that's where we're able to more formally check a patient's visual acuity. Now the important thing here is that we don't necessarily need to have a child be able to recognize letters or be able to read the eye chart that you know, has the, the Snellen letters on them to, for us to be able to check their visual acuity. You can see here on the right, this is a sample of a child-friendly visual screening chart. This is Leah symbols, and you can see these shapes are often much easier for children to be able to pick out and feel comfortable with than when they're just starting to learn how to read and recognize letters. 
Instrument-based vision screening has become much more popular over the last several years, and it's allowed us to pick up children who have amblyopic risk factors at a much earlier age than we used to be able to. With this, a machine is used, usually in the primary care provider's office, that has automated software that estimates a child's refractive error. Depending on the machine that's used, some can actually also detect strabismus or um, other ocular anomalies within the eye. Now the important thing to recognize here though is that these, these instrument-based vision screening devices do not diagnose amblyopia, but they can pick up risk factors for the amblyopia. So if there's any concern in the part of the exam or from the readout from the machine, that's the point where the patient should really be sent to, for a more formal ophthalmology assessment. So at the ophthalmologist, what can you expect? Well, the child will have a more formal visual acuity and ocular motility exam. They'll also receive a slit lamp and dilated fundoscopic exam to screen for any structural ocular pathology. And then finally, they'll undergo a refraction to look for any refractive error. Now in children, this refraction is typically done after they receive dilation drops because checking a refraction in children after dilation is the most accurate way of being able to do that. Now, at this point, um, I want to go over you know, the motivation and how we treat amblyopia. Now first off, what is, our motiv what is our rationale for wanting to treat amblyopia to begin with? In bilateral cases, I think it makes you know, a lot of sense, it's pretty self-evident, that we would want to improve a patient's vision in both eyes and be able to improve their amblyopia because that can help their baseline level of function and be able to accomplish their normal daily visual tasks. And also, this may also help some children meet their developmental milestones that perhaps were missed earlier on. It can help them learn to walk, be able to navigate their environment with less fear of falling or stumbling or you know, getting into some objects. But in unilateral cases, it may not be so evident why we should be treating unilateral amblyopia. These are kids that typically are doing very well. They're functioning well, they're playing sports, they're doing well in school, they're able to read because they're using their good eye. Because they're ignoring their bad eye, they're not really reliant upon it and they don't realize that there's a problem with it until somebody tells them. And so in these cases, there's really two different reasons why we choose to, to treat the unilateral amblyopia. One is the spare tire theory. These children have an entire lifetime ahead of them where they need to have good vision. Should anything happen to their good eye, and that could be from trauma, from any kind of ocular disease, such as glaucoma or macular degeneration, we want them to have a good functioning fellow eye that they can depend on in those situations. And we know from several studies that patients with amblyopia are at higher risk of losing vision from their fellow eye, and most of those cases are from trauma. The other reason that we prefer to treat unilateral amblyopia is because of the idea of binocularity. Binocularity is the idea that the brain uses the information from both eyes and coordinates that together to help perform various visual tasks. And that also helps with depth perception. So one of the main rules in amblyopia treatment is to treat the underlying cause first. First get rid of the incriminating factor. So for example, in visual deprivation amblyopia, we want to remove the cataract if the cataract is the problem. In ptosis, we want to do eyelid surgery to raise that eyelid if that's the incriminated problem. In refractive amblyopia, we give eyeglasses to remove the blur. Now the one caveat to this rule is in the case of strabismic amblyopia. In this case, we want to treat the amblyopia first before we would consider any type of strabismus surgery. The reason for that is we know that the better vision that children have going into surgery, the better chances they have of having good surgical results after. In addition to that, by having good vision, that can also change the strabismus that children have, so much so to the point that perhaps they don't need strabismus surgery in the future. Now I mentioned that eyeglasses are a seminal part of treating refractive amblyopia. And I really can't stress enough how important eyeglasses can be in amblyopia treatment. In fact, if we look at just using eyeglasses alone with no other adjunct in amblyopia treatment, we can see improvement in visual acuity in the amblyopic eye in two-thirds of children in the, of the age three to seven years. 
And even when we look at the older age group, of the 7 to 17 year age group, which is typically an age group where we have a lot more difficulty in affecting a change in amblyopia because we're near the end of that critical period of visual development, we still see some benefit in just the use of eyeglasses alone in a quarter of these children. Now, just because eyeglasses have been shown to be very effective, that doesn't mean that it's an easy treatment to prescribe. As you can imagine, some children take very well to their eyeglasses and they love wearing them, while others are very resistant to keeping anything on their face. So this is where really having good fit of these eyeglasses can make a huge difference in the level of compliance in children with their eyeglasses. It's important to have an optician be able to look at your child and fit them well with pediatric frames to ensure this good fit. Because what we don't want are heavy glasses that are falling down a patient's nose, so that way they're looking over them, as you can see in the top figure over there, or that they're so uncomfortable that the child just wants to take them off. So some of the things that we look for in, in glasses, particularly in babies and young children, is we're looking for these very light, flexible single piece frames as you can see on the bottom picture over there. To, to encourage children to keep their eyeglasses on, we can also look for eyeglasses that have a head strap or have these temple cables as you can see here that wrap around the ears. And then finally, we recommend all children when they're receiving eyeglasses to have polycarbonate lenses. These lenses are more impact resistant and thus really important for a very active child. Now what about patching? Now, while we talked about removing the incriminating factor, using eyeglasses and such, what patching does is it gives the brain dedicated time with the amblyopic eye, and it forces the brain to spend more attention on the amblyopic eye. So for a dedicated number of hours each day, we prescribe the parents to patch the good eye, which is the non-amblyopic eye. Now, in the past, patching used to be a much more labor-intensive process for both parents and the patients because they would be told to patch the eye all waking hours or six of the waking hours. But we know from several studies that even part-time patching, even patching the good eye a couple hours each day can give as much benefit for amblyopia as a longer duration of patching hours. Now some of the things that we want to look for when we are patching our child's eyes is you want to get an adhesive patch as you can see in these three children over here and these can be used either alone by themselves if the patients don't wear glasses already but if they do wear glasses you put them underneath the eyeglasses and the important thing is to prevent peaking which children are very adept at being able to do. Now I mentioned peaking as one of the problems that we see in patching because even though patching has been tried and true and it's a very effective modality of treatment amblyopia, it can sometimes be not a very popular treatment with children. They don't want to keep the patch on. And so there are some alternatives that we can offer to certain groups of patients depending on their qualifications. So one of these alternatives is pharmacological penalization. Basically, we can use a dilation drop to the good eye. So in this case, what we're doing is we're not occluding the good eye and preventing visual stimulation from that eye, but we're just blurring it. And so by blurring that good fellow eye, we're again forcing the brain to use the bad eye or the amblyopic eye instead. Now, the advantage of using the dilation eye drops is in many cases, it's easier for the parents because they only have to put the eye drop in perhaps a couple times a week, rather than forcing their child to, you know, to, to put a patch on for a couple hours each day when they're fighting him on it. However, the important thing to remember though is that not every patient is a candidate for pharmacological penalization. It's really only of use for patients who have milder degrees of amblyopia and also for patients who have specific types of refractive error. The other thing is that with patching, you know, once the patient removes that patch, once they're done with their two hours a day, their good eye goes back to the normal visual acuity. However, with, with the um, eye drops, what occurs is during the length of duration of treatment, which can sometimes last several months, that good eye will always have a decreased visual acuity. And again, um, because that eye will be dilated, some of these patients will also experience photosensitivity. Now what else can we do? Well, another way that we can effectively blur the good eye is through optical penalization. This is where we change the eyeglasses prescription so that the 
the amblyopic eye receives the optimized eyeglasses prescription, while the fellow fellow good eye essentially receives a suboptimal prescription and effectively has a blur in that way. Another way to accomplish the same thing is through band girder filters. Band girder filters are essentially a clear translucent filter that causes a blur. The advantage of using this filter is that it can be taken on and off of the eyeglasses. So when the treatment is over, it can be taken off. And when used properly, it can be very effective at improving visual acuity and amblyopic eyes. The nice thing about this too is it's often very imperceptible to the outside observer that the patient has a filter to begin with. This is a picture of a patient who's using a band girder filter over the right lens, and you can see that beyond just a little bit more glare, it's really imperceptible. But the important thing is, in order for either the band girder filter or in the last case, the optical penalization by changing the eyeglasses prescription, in order for these therapies to work, the patient has to wear the glasses, and they have to wear the glasses so they're not peeking over. So <clears throat> our success of treatment really depends on compliance. Now, as far as future directions that we can go, um, now, as I, as I mentioned, you know, our, the crux of the success of our amblyopia treatment really depends on compliance. And so, as, um, as the years have gone on, many people have been looking to other modes of treating amblyopia in these patients who are resistant to wearing their eyeglasses or resistant to keeping their patch on. And so that's really been the direction of a lot of our, our studies. Now, one of these areas of interest right now is refractive surgery, or LASIK or PRK. Now, traditionally, LASIK and PRK have been um, procedures that have been discouraged in children because children's eyes are, are constantly changing. They're growing. The refractive area is changing. However, many studies have shown that in patients with anisometropic amblyopia, again, that's where their eyes have a, a big difference in refractive error, that there may be some utility in using LASIK at that, or, I'm, I'm sorry, PRK, which is photorefractive keratectomy, during that time. At this point, because of the patients not refusing to wear their eyeglasses, if we can effectively use the refractive surgery to clear their images during that critical period of visual development, we may be able to stimulate the brain to develop more properly in a normal fashion. So that way, even when they get older, if they have to wear eyeglasses, at least their visual potential has improved. <clears throat> And then finally, one of the other hot areas of interest right now is dicoptic therapy. Dicoptic therapy is where visual stimulation is provided to both eyes at the same time, but, in, but separately. In this case, the amblyopic eye will receive higher contrast images, while the good eye, the fellow eye, will receive lower contrast images. So the amblyopic eye will be getting more visual stimulation. And ways to um, encourage compliance with this therapy is that often the visual tasks that are given to children during this time are fun, they're entertaining, they're movies or video games such as Tetris. So this is an example of one of these dicoptic movie images. You can see on the left, this is the image that we be, would be presented to the amblyopic eye. It's higher contrast versus the image that's presented on the right, that would be presented to the fellow eye or the good eye, and it's lower contrast. And there are these strategically placed blobs that obscure part of the image in both eyes. The reason they do this is because then the child is forced to use the information from both eyes together in order to follow the movie and in order to play the video game. So this perhaps may be a more engaging way to treat amblyopia than just having them patch one of their eyes a couple hours a day. So in summary, it's important for us to be able to recognize and diagnose vision disorders in early childhood so that we can prevent amblyopia. And once amblyopia is recognized, it's important that we treat it consistently because if we can, we can ensure lifelong good vision for our children. These are my references. And at this point, I believe we have some questions um, from the audience at home. So one of the, the first questions is, does the above mentioned treatment work for adults? This is a very good question. And I, 
in the past, I would say that it was considered no, that once that critical period of visual development, <clears throat> which is usually up to the age of eight to nine years, that really the visual development had stopped. However, many studies are now showing that there's probably some, still some residual flexibility in our visual system as we get older. However, like I mentioned before, the earlier um, the, the earlier the event that causes vision loss, or the earlier the um, treatment is initiated, the more chances we have of effect. So, if as an adult, if we tried patching or if we tried these other therapies for amblyopia, well, we could probably still affect a small change in visual acuity. It may not be substantial, substantial enough to really affect their normal daily life. Okay, and the the uh, second question is, you know, how is amblyopia diagnosed? So this is something that's really diagnosed with the aid of your ophthalmologist. So, you know, once the incriminating factors have been removed, once the eyeglasses have been used to remove the blur and refractive error, once the cataract has been taken out, you know, once the eyelid has been lifted, if there's still a different a disparity in visual acuity between what that eye is seeing and what should normally be seen, that's where we can be very suspicious of amblyopia. So at this point, I think this is the conclusion of this presentation. I want to thank you for tuning in to this webinar.